All right, it's 11 o'clock, so we're going to get started. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today for our webinar. My name is Jackie Carville, and I'll be coordinating the webinar today. I'm here with Matthew Kaiser, who will be going over some of the new features and studies done with the LaserGene 12.2 software. He'll be discussing several methods you can use to optimize your ion torrent and Illumina data for the most accurate next-gen sequence assemblies. You may have noticed that your phone has been muted. However, we do encourage you to ask questions along the way. To ask a question, just type it into the chat dialog and select Send to Host. I will then direct these questions to Matt during breaks during the webinar uh, to be answered for the whole group. If you need any assistance or have any questions during the webinar, feel free to send a chat message to me, email me at webinars at dnastar.com, or tweet us at the Twitter handle at dnastarinc. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Matt. Great. Thank you, Jackie. And thank you for uh, joining us today. I'm going to uh, take just a second here and share my desktop. Hopefully that will come through okay. All righty. Okay. So as Jackie mentioned, uh, today is going to be a webinar that focuses on one of the newest workflows in uh, DNA Star software, and that is uh, uh, using Illumina and Ion Torrent data uh, in gene panel or exome assemblies, and uh, we have a, a mechanism now to assess the accuracy of those uh, of those alignments. And I'm going to show you the uh, the process, how to do that in the software, and then we'll uh, look at some of the results as well that have been uh, published recently. Um, before we get started, though, I thought I'd give you a little bit of an introduction to DNA Star if you're not familiar with us. Um, here's a nice picture of our, our Madison, Wisconsin, where we're located. Uh, it looks nothing like that right now. It is all ice and snow and, and about zero degrees outside, so I wish it looked like that. Um, so DNA Star has produced software for um, over 30 years now, and uh, we really have a lot of different aims, and one of them with, with NGS software is to support all the different NGS platforms that are out there. And so uh, we try to have flexible software um, that can accommodate not only multiple platforms, but multiple workflows. And today really is a webinar focused on one of those workflows, and we're going to focus on data from two companies, Illumina and Ion Torrent. And I'll show you uh, some of the results that we get with, with, uh, with both companies and, and how to set up uh, the different workflow using these uh, uh, two different technologies. So DNA Star also uh, designs software that uh, is extremely powerful and only has modest hardware requirements. And so it's optimized to run you know, on a desktop computer or even a, a laptop. Today we're, we're talking about gene panels and exomes. Uh, those can be assembled you know, even on a laptop computer. And so kind of the basic hardware configuration is, you know, a, a say, a four-core computer with 16 gigs of RAM. Uh, this scratch disk that you can use to process data files. So the, 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 in this case, the human genome template files are quite large, and so those get processed on disk as does the query data, and then enough storage for the, the, the input and output data. And so this is really, a, you know, kind of a modest requirement. Uh, it gives us excellent performance, but if you don't have... Uh, this hardware available and you'd like to try the software out, there are other options. Uh, one of the options, uh, again, was introduced uh, within the last year, and that's just using Amazon's hardware. And so we have the ability to set up an assembly on your local computer and then use Amazon's hardware up in the cloud to run the assembly, and then you can return the results. And it uses a, a, a new DNA Star um, cloud data drive that's secure, uses, uses the HTTPS protocol, same thing they use for you know, wire transferring money, so it's a very secure protocol. Um, and it really has nice performance, so it's a very, very fast data transfer, so the data goes up really quickly. Um, you can run multiple assemblies concurrently, so if you've got a lot of, you know, an example of, of usage would be if you have, you know, 20 exomes that you need done overnight, you can use the cloud and it will run 20 concurrent exomes and, and return the results for you in, in just a few hours. So, so this is another option also for demoes. If, again, if you don't have the hardware to try out the software, you can use this hardware up in the cloud. So it's a, a great resource. Uh, another aspect of DNA Star is the support that we provide. Um, and the support comes in many different ways. You can always call us and talk to, to, talk to us directly, um, email support. Uh, we have uh, demo videos that are up on our website. You can see 
Um, under our support section, you know, a whole series of ion torrent, and there's some PacBio and 454 and Illumina uh, specific uh, workflows. And then there's NGS workflows and then basic uh, molecular biology workflows and protein analysis workflows. So it's a great resource. These are five, you know, roughly five minute videos. So it's a great way to learn about a specific task in the software. Uh, another, another thing is uh, the monthly webinars, like the one that we're doing right now. Uh, we've been doing these since 2012. I've done quite a few of them, and you can see that they're on all different topics. Uh, a few months ago, I did a gene panel workflows, and we have overview webinars and protein webinars. Um, and so these are, are scheduled, you know, roughly one, once a month. Um, I also do personal webinars. So if there's a topic that we don't cover, or if you have specific data sets or questions, you're certainly welcome to contact me, um, and I can do a personal webinar with you and schedule that at your convenience. So again, we have we have top-notch support for for our customers. And then one of the first questions that will come up. Uh, when we're talking especially desktop software and big data sets is how fast is, is the assembler? And, you know, can it handle human genome or exome data sets? And this is uh, some data that comes off of our website. And you can see, you know, even the larger data sets like human genomes um, using, in this case, it's Illumina data, and 1.2 billion reads and almost 40x coverage, the assembly time is about 13 hours. Um, exome data sets, and these are what we're going to look at today, um, take, you know, anywhere from an hour and a half to three hours, depending on the size of the exome. And this assembly time includes um, processing the data, doing the assembly, building the output files, you know, the VCF or BAM files, um, and then creating an output file format. So this is a very, very fast time. It's especially important if you've got, you know, multiple projects that you're trying to get done. Um, it's nice to have an exome that finishes in under two hours, whereas many open source softwares, you know, could take, you know, six hours or eight hours per exome. Uh, smaller data sets, <clears throat> excuse me, like uh, cancer panels, um, in this case an ion torrent panel, you know, we measure those in minutes. And really these times can be faster. Um, our, our assembler will process the genome templates and reuse the partially processed file. So the first time you run the assembly is actually the slowest time from that point on, when you reuse that same template, um, it, it's about 20 to 30 percent faster than that initial time. So again, excellent uh, speed here with, with our assembler. And really what the focus is today is, is the accuracy. So we've had the speed for quite some time. I think DNA Star has been the fastest for the last several years. And really in the last, you know, I'll say year or so, our focus has been on um, improving the accuracy. And what really made this possible was the, um, the, the large validated data sets. And we'll talk in depth about those more. And um, these large validated data sets are essentially a human genome that has um, a large number of the SNPs that have been validated using a number of different sequencing technologies and a number of different assemblers and a number of different SNP callers. And these are provided then um, through NIST at Genome and Bottle. And there's information on exactly how we do this. Uh, we have a white paper here, and I can, uh, this is a new white paper on the DNA Star website. And so if you want to learn more about, you know, the real details about how these validated data sets are used, uh, we have this white paper on our website, and it compares us to uh, BWA GATK workflows, which come with uh, the Illumina MySeq instrument. And so we have a comparison here using this uh, hat map sample, NA12878. And so this exome is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to look at some results from our assembler, you know, using this control exome. And this data is available through the Genome in a Bottle Consortium. So if I click here, um, and so you can go and check out Genome in a Bottle. And this is absolutely um, critical to improving software. Um, prior to Genome in a Bottle, uh, we had very few data sets that had uh, enough validated SNPs to really make wide-scale software improvements. You know, you'd have a handful of SNPs here or there, but what you really need are tens of thousands of SNPs, you know, and big data sets so you can make sure that when you change a parameter or you tweak an algorithm, that as a whole you're improving and you're not just optimizing for a couple of positions throughout the genome. So this is really, really important, and the consortium's been great to work with by providing data sets. They're working on new data sets. Um, they had a recent workshop um, to discuss the new data sets they're working at and how to improve the existing data sets. So I'd, I'd encourage you, if you're interested in 
accuracy and validation. You know, check out Genome in a Bottle, um, check out our white paper on our website, and then of course uh, we'll talk about more of that in the webinar today. So our accuracy, um, and I say greater than 99.7%, um, and that's using the Genome in a Bottle standard. Uh, now the standard isn't quite 100% accurate, so the, the real accuracy is somewhat, you know, it's somewhere between 99.7 and 100, somewhere in there, and we're still working to figure out exactly um, what that is. Um, part of the discussion today, uh, I'll be mentioning BED files and VCF files extensively, and so it's very important that we understand what these two file types are. Uh, BED files are tab delimited text files that um, contain a list of the targeted regions in the genome. So they can be very, very simple files. They can be a three column headerless file, you know, with chromosome in the first column, start position in the second, and end position in the third column, right? So they can be very simplistic. Or they can be more complex. They can have a header that contains some information. They can have additional columns that contain even things like gene annotation. Um, but the bed files are, are, are very, very important because they tell our software, here's the regions that are interesting, or here are the regions of high confidence that we know we can make SNP calls to a very, very high degree of accuracy. And so for gene panels and exomes, um, usually the bed files are provided by Illumina or Ion Torrent from the sequence provider or whoever designed the panel that you're using. You may have your own panel. You may be designing your own gene panels and have uh, you know, an Excel sheet with the coordinates. Those Excel sheets can be easily converted into a bed file format. So bed files we'll talk about. VCF files um, are you know, gaining a lot more popularity, so most folks know what, what these are, but they're variant call format files. Um, and they can be very simple as well. They can contain just, you know, chromosome in one column and the position in the next. And they may or may not have a header. Typically, they have a, a simple header. Uh, some VCF files have very complex headers with all sorts of annotation um, information. So they may have literally hundreds of columns of annotation. So if you go to 1,000 genomes, for instance, and download a VCF file, it can be a, a gigantic file with massive amounts of, of annotation. So We'll be using these files today in the validation process. So I'll be mentioning them um, multiple times here. So there's uh, so so the kind of a workflow that we're doing is uh, and, and really why it's why it's important to discuss it is that DNA Star is providing its customers a mechanism or a means to take their data and figure out exactly what their accuracy is. And that's really a kind of a, a, a rarity, I think, with software companies. And uh, it, it can oftentimes be very difficult to get the right data sets, run it through a software, and figure out exactly how accurate you are. And, and I've, I've worked with many, many customers over the last several years, and most of them uh, don't actually know what the, the accuracy is of their whole process. They may have a handful of SNPs they know they should be able to detect. Um, so we thought it would be very important to provide them with a means to do this. And so if we look at this kind of let me grab a highlighter here. You know, this, this top part of the workflow. We need a targeted regions file. That's our bed file. Um, and then uh, we can intersect this file with these high confidence regions from a standard. So we, that's one thing we can do to say, here's the regions that are common between our bed file and genome in a bottle high confidence areas. So we can create this intersection file between the two bed files for customers. That's something that we can do using tools at DNA Star. We also have these intersected bed files for a number of the commercial, commonly um, used commercial files. Um, you may also just have your own set of variants. So you might have your own bed file that has, you know, a few hundred SNPs in it that you know aren't a sample. So you may not need, you may just use your bed file and, and variant file. And then we use that bed file then with our uh, VCF file, and the data flow then is a validated data set. In this case, it's going to be the NA12878 um, data sets. We run them through our assembler, our variant caller, an annotator for the variants, and we make those calls. And at the end of our pipeline, when we feed the data in, our ArrayStar software will do the accuracy calculations you know, and a validation report here at the end. And so I'm going to show you this process, you know, how we set this up. So the software interface then, you can see that if you had to do all this by hand, uh, it could be very difficult. You're, you're looking at big tables of data, hand calculating values. 
we've automated this to make it as easy as possible. So all these steps then become much more streamlined. Um, there's also this, this figure I should mention comes out of um, a recent Gen article, and I can click on the link. So this I think just came out this week, and Jackie can provide some more information on this as well. So there's a, a, an article that, yes, came out February 15th, um, validating NGS based genetic tests. So again, what I'm talking about today is uh, discussed in this GEN article, and you can see that's where our figure came from. Um, so I would encourage you again, if you're interested again in this workflow, check out this GEN article as well. Okay, so back to our PowerPoint here. So a little bit more about the bed files, and, and I apologize for my, my crude use of, of PowerPoint here, but I, I tried to draw kind of a cartoon drawing of what the bed files really are doing. So it's, it's the NIST high confidence bed file. So this is represented by the red, solid red line here. Okay, and you can see the human chromosome um, in its length. And then the NIST bed file is targeting not the entire chromosome. There are regions in the chromosome um, that can't be called. They can't be assembled very well for one. And if they can't be assembled very well, then the SNP calls can't be very accurate. It could be highly repetitive, low information areas. Um, a lot of times they happen at, at telomeres and centromeres. And so the NIST bed file uh, covers, you know, about, I want to say about 80% of the human genome is in their bed file. And so, so it's a big bed file, lots of regions. You may have your own bed file then, and I call this the gene panel bed file, right, or exome bed file that is targeted genes you know, throughout the genome. And so there are regions of overlap. And those regions of overlap, I've just outlined with these red boxes, okay? And so the intersected bed file then is, here are those regions where our bed file overlaps the high confidence regions from genome in a bottle. And we can use those regions then to determine, can we detect all the SNPs that are in, these, in this sample you know, at those locations? And so, the purple or the pink uh, diamonds that are in the boxes, those are the SNPs that we should detect at nearly 100%, right? We know they're in this sample in, in these high confidence regions. So that's um, how we use the genome in a bottle to really um, get a, a large scale validation. And, and as I mentioned earlier, it's not necessary. You could have your own bed file with highly validated SNPs in it, and you can just use those two to go through this exact same process. So it's flexible enough to accommodate you know, a couple of different scenarios. So at this point, um, we're going to move out of the PowerPoint, and I'd like to show you, you know, how this is done in the software. And so we're going to go into uh, the starting point is our SeqMan engine software and uh, our gene panel workflows. And so we've got, uh, you know, a Mendelian germline workflow, a cancer somatic, and really the validation workflow, uh, we'll consider that as a third workflow in the software. And so I'll show you how that gets set up and some of the downstream analysis tools that we have. So we'll jump out of this. Uh, let's see, I don't need those. So I'll go into Seekman Engine. So Seekman Engine is uh, the assembly software um, that, that uh, is in the DNA Star Genomics suite. So it's the typical starting point for um, working with NGS data. And so in this case, we're going to create a new assembly project. Um, if I needed to use uh, Amazon's hardware, I could select this box, enter my email and password, and, and then it looks just how it does here. I set the assembly up, but when I click assemble, it's actually using a, a remote computer. So it's a, it's a really nice piece of functionality. But we're just going to create a new project here. And I'll pick uh, the germline. So when you go through the germline workflow, Mendelian, that will give us access to this validation um, assembly. And so it's designed so that um, the idea here is that you might run a validation assembly with multiple samples. So you may have your regular samples and with each batch run a validation using this control genome to see, to validate your process each time you, you, you uh, assemble a batch of, of samples or batch, batch of exomes. So this is a uh, assembly with the control and I can name the project. So I've kind of pre-filled in some of this just to spare a little bit of uh, time here. And I pick an output folder. So in this case, I'll just pick my webinar folder. 
a temporary file location. Again, if you're going to be trying the software out, um, this is the scratch disk where temporary files are written. So you, if you do a, a demo of the software, make sure that you have enough space. Usually a terabyte drive is, is sufficient for exomes or gene panels or anything that's smaller than a human genome. And there's a link there for technical requirements. Um, the template files, I'm going to add a genome template package. Uh, and if you ask what a genome template package is, those are provided uh, on the DNA Star website, again, under the support section. And uh, genome template packages are kind of pre-bundled packages that include the annotated reference chromosomes, the dbSNP database. For humans, there's a cosmic cancer database and a genome evolutionary rate profile database uh, that's all kind of bundled together. And these you can download, you know, from our website. All right, so, so highly preferable to use a genome template package um, if you're working in a model organism. And so I've got one here on my, my data drive. Uh, another thing to point out is when you're doing these sorts of workflows, it's very important that you match up the right version of your genome with your bed file. So bed files and DCF files are specific to a particular um, build of the genome, right? And so you want to make sure, um, and there's oftentimes not information within those files to tell software if they match up or not. So now I'm going to pick a bed file. And so this is, uh, this is from the exome data set I have here is from the short read archive by AirUp Labs. Um, and so I'm going to grab the bed file. All right, now I load in the sequence data. And so this is going to be, in this case, Illumina paired data. And I don't think I moved it here, so I'm going to go. So I'm going to go up to my network here. So I didn't move my data files down, and you can see short read archive folder. And so these are data sets. I'll mention them uh, later. Uh, we'll go back to the PowerPoint. Um, these are data sets I downloaded earlier this month, or back back in late January, and they're all from the NA12878 reference genome from the HapMap genome. And so these other uh, Exome data sets are freely available to download from the short read archive. And so I'm going to load two FASTQ files here. These are the paired files and the paired distance. Close is good enough in that case. Now the interface would allow me to have a control data set plus experimental data sets. And so it's, it, it can support multiple sample data run as separate projects. So you know I could have 20 exomes here and I would specify what each one of them is. In this case, this one's a validation, right? So I could have my control here. So we're just doing a simple experiment here, All right? But I could have many more. And then it asks us to, to specify what each, so I named mine such, but it also asks us to specify which of these experiments are the controls. And so this, in fact, is a control, it's a validation, so the type, is a validation. And now it asks me what VCF file, and essentially where are the answers that we're going to compare against to, to uh, generate all the accuracy statistics. So, so I can load, in this case it's an NIST genome in a bottle validated SNP file. So that's what we're going to compare against. All right. Uh, then we just have some assembly options. Uh, this is going to be a diploid. Um, there's some SNP filtering um, with um, high, medium, low, and it really should be extremely high, high, and or pretty high and high. They're, they're, they're all actually in this workflow, um, very stringent. I'll just show you what, what I mean by that. Um, we'll probably have to come up with different names there at some point, but so you'll see these later on in our validation. So if I go to SNP filter str stringency, what high, medium, and low mean is that these are the, the default filters that will be applied um, to the data set. And, and before we had a validated, validated data set, it was kind of a guess filtering. You know, you just said, well, it looks good if I filter at depth of 10, and it looks good if I filter with a probability value of 90%, right? But you didn't, it was hard to get enough data to actually validate what the best filters are for different data sets. And customers would often ask, well, how much depth do I need, you know, to, to apply filters? And it really still is an unknown. People just kind of pick 10 or pick 5 or pick 50. Um, and what's nice about a validation is you can actually, you know, try out different filters and look at what the actual result is across thousands and thousands of SNPs. 
And so we, we found that um, a low stringency, that's depth of two, peanut ref of 90, is pretty good baseline filtering. You actually are fairly accurate there. Um, but when we do our, our, uh, our accuracy measurements, it's really more along the medium lines, a depth of 10 or so. And we'll look at that in a little bit of detail um, a little bit later. So we'll just stick with our default here. There's more advanced options I won't um, go into there. Um, so now it's set up. So it's easy just to kind of set things up. Um, and then what's, what's happening now is there's a script that's being written to the assembler. This is the instruction for the assembler. A script file, a text file is written out. You can save that out to the output folder, right? And then we click assemble and it's ready to go, right? So it will um, start processing the data files. We can watch it if, there, if there's a problem with hardware or files or some other incompatibility, uh, we'll get error messages right here. And so, so if you do have a problem with an assembly, you can export a log, you send that to DNA star, and we can troubleshoot. Um, so when this is done, and this, this exome takes about two hours, when it would finish, there's going to be a button here, a next button that allows us to look at the project report, so we get the assembly metrics, and then there'll be another button that says validate the SNPs. And that's actually a linkage to our, our uh, another program in our suite, our Raystar software. And what happens then is it automatically loads all that raw data into a Raystar, which has all the infrastructure for making the statistical calls and the calculations. And it generates a text report that is essentially the answer. Um, and, and the answer then, we'll, we'll look at that um, shortly. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop this because this is, uh, we don't want it to interfere with our webinar. It's pretty, I'll show you why it might. Just to give you an idea how this assembler works, it's called XNG, and it's using right there 99% of the processors on this computer. So it's optimized to, at least initially while it's crunching data, to use everything you've got on that desktop to get this assembly done as quickly as possible. All right, so um, even webinars, can we can start losing audio if we let, let it run. It starts to settle down after the first 30 minutes or so, then we can do other things. So I'm going to quit this and look at the couple of different outputs that we get. So one of the outputs is in Seekman Pro, which is you know the software that's part of our core suite that thousands of customers have access to. And Seekman Pro allows us to look at the assembled data. And this is what's really nice with the, with the DNA Star suite is that we can do a validation like this, but it's more than just getting accuracy. We can go in and, and really look in detail in the assembly and figure out, you know, different kinds of accuracy, like how many um, targets did we hit with our capture? Did we miss exons? So we can get a report there, and we can look at the SNPs that we did miss. So if we didn't get 100%, what happened to the 1% that we missed? You know, what, what was the reason for missing that 1%? And so we have a really nice uh, way to do that, and that's in Seekman um, to, to, to go and look at things. So you can see, um, for this exome, it took 42 minutes. On the second time around, it was faster. Um, so there's just some raw data here, so I can get a feel for how many sequences assembled, how much pair data there was. Um, in the SNPs, I can see how many user SNPs. So these are the SNPs in that validated file. So there was 15,864. And then it tells me how many were missing. And there were 301 that had coverage at that location, but we didn't call a SNP there. So there's a so these are the ones that weren't called. And then there are some where there's no sequence data, 602. We can go and look at those areas now to try to figure out, well, why, you know, why do we have some missing areas? Um, so that's in this report. So I'll show you, this window is all the chromosomes. If I want to run a report for the whole genome, I just click the header. And a couple of these reports are really big. So the show coverage of targeted regions, uh, it takes about two minutes to generate this one because there's so much data in it. And what this is then is it's looking at the bed file that we used. And you can see here, it's very small font, but it says number of capture regions, 201,323. So that's how many cap individual exons were targeted in this exome. And here's the feature, here's the location in the genome, the contig ID, which is the chromosome, the length. We get the coverage depth and the percent of that targeted area that's covered, and then read counts and so forth. And so I might want to look at this and 
you know, and figure out if I'm designing a gene panel, for instance, if I miss some targets, maybe I have to go and redo the probes or primers for those targets. Or maybe if I ordered this from, you know, a, a company and I'm missing a couple genes I'm interested in, maybe I have to use a PCR-directed approach for a few of the exons. And so that's kind of what this enrichment report is, is a summary then of the targeting. So it's really a quality control. There's some loss in our SNP accuracy just because the exome that we have didn't hit all the targets. And that's very common then. You can see, you know, co coverage at 10%, 94.36% of the targets have at least 10x coverage. And then we can see, you know, at 1x, 97.33. And I get things like read enrichment. That's the percent of the reads that actually align to my uh, targeted areas. So, of course, in this case, I use a more restricted, validated, high confidence read. And so that's why this typically this would be higher if you're using just the bed file that came directly with that particular exome. So it's a really nice breakdown of some of the raw data for um, the targeting report. And then we can go and look at details. So I might sort by percent covered here. And you can see on the scroll bar, when I get to about here, it's at 100%. So the vast majority of the targets have quite a bit of coverage, but there's some that have no coverage at all. Um, so I might look at those or look at the genes that are here and figure out, do I need to, you know, redo the experiment? Do I need to design some PCR primers? There's also a not targeted. And this is a list of, of, of regions that have lots of sequence coverage but weren't in my bed file. Uh, in some cases, this is, can indicate, you know, a problem with the specificity of the targeting. And you can see some regions here, lots of pseudogenes popping up, and I can go and look at those. So these reports are interactive then with the alignment view. So I can go and look at that region, look at the annotations that are there, and determine, you know, is that kind of nonspecific? That looks like it's pretty specific alignment there. It looks like a good alignment. So maybe my probe capture was grabbing a little uh, too much of the pseudogenes in those cases. So it's, again, it's an excellent report to start with. Um, there's also a SNP report. And the SNP report now will use some of those filters that we looked at uh, briefly uh, to filter out some of the noise. And, and there's an elaborate filter dialogue here. So we can filter and find SNPs of all different um, um, categories, you know, by substitution or indel or their functional impact on the protein or based on alignment metrics. Um, for gene panels, we automatically apply filters, show us SNPs in the targeted regions, and show us the annotated SNPs that were in our answer file, in our VCF file. And then there's some other, you know, 90% p-value, depth of 10, um, that are applied to this uh, report. So I'm just going to close the filter. So here's the results, and I can see, you know, there's 15,308 SNPs, and this is all, again, interactive with the alignment views. So I can double click on a SNP, go and look at it, look at the annotations. SeekMan is the best interface for um, interacting with the assembly. It's you know vastly superior to a kind of a, a cumbersome or clunky Genome browser for doing this sort of work. And so I can go in and look at individual SNPs. Now, when we're developing software and we're using the validation test, I might be more interested in this category of SNPs. And these are missing SNPs. So these are SNPs that were in our answer that should have been called in our data. There's only 10 of them, so there's not a lot of them here. But I can see just by looking at the columns of information that the one thing that jumps out at me is the SNP percent is low. You know, in all cases here, it's below 25%. So in a diploid individual, um, you would expect the SNPs to be, you know, close to 50% or 100% for heterozygotes or homozygotes. So, you know, we can look at these areas and see, you know, is what was the reason that this SNP was missed? You know, in this case, it's hard to see, I know, but it's, it's red colored. In this case, there just weren't enough of those SNPs to be called. So there's always a few that kind of fall, just fall off the edge of detection as a heterozygous SNP. In some cases, it's a bad, uh, you know, assembly. So we can go and look at it and say, oh, we didn't gap something quite right. Let's tweak the algorithm just a tad, see if we can pick up a few of those missed SNPs. All right, so again, the validation is a great, great tool um, for improving the whole process. It really gives us a mechanism to do that. So that is the SNP report. So again, SeekMan gives us this kind of great interface then for looking at the coverage, looking at the SNPs. 
Um, now, at the end of the assembly, we also get a validation report that is automatically calculated by a raised star. And it's just a text report. And so here's what that report looks like. Um, and so it's a lot of text here, a lot of, lot of different information. Um, but we can see here that, um, let's just get to the good stuff here. Uh, so there's a summary of uh, how many SNPs there are. Um, this kind of statement here really is just the summarizing statement for the, for the project. So given a minimum depth of 10, coverage of 10, 15,307 out of 15,370 uh, SNPs were identified using a, a probability value of 0.9. So that's kind of summarizing uh, uh, the statement for what the, where the accuracy is going to be calculated. Then we get things like uh, how many you know, uh, bases were covered with a depth of at least 10, the percentage. So again, this is, was also in the other report that we looked at for XM coverages. And then from this raw data, ArrayStar will automatically calculate you know, the number of true positives, the number of false positives, uh, true negatives, false negatives. And from this raw data, um, that's how you can calculate things like sensitivity and specificity and false discovery rate, which are the three kind of things that we're, that we're really interested in. And so then all the data then is displayed in this table. And this is a table that's really helpful because if you have questions like, you know, why do I apply a depth filter of five or should, should, it, should I apply a depth filter more rigorous at 25 or 100 even? And the calculations then are done at all different depths of coverages. So, for example, we can look at, you know, here's depth of 10, P not ref value of 0.9, and I can see that 15,307 true positives are, de are detected. And I can see that the false discovery rate here is about 1.6. It's really, it's nice and low. And the um, sensitivity is 99.59%. So this is, um, you know, a really nice result. Then I can look, if I go to more stringent, I say, well, at 50x coverage, is that better? Is it better just to be really stringent? Well, what happens, I, just, I, I go down to 12,692 true positives. You lose a lot of true positives. And I look over here at the um, specificity, and I'm at 99.7. So I hardly gain anything in accuracy or sensitivity or specificity, but I lose a whole bunch of false or a bunch of true positives. Right, so you can kind of look at where the balance is. So when you're doing your own analysis, I might decide, well, hey, at 5x coverage, I get 15,563, and my false discovery rate only goes up a little bit, and my, um, my specificity, or my, excuse me, my sensitivity drops just a little bit, 99.2. So you can use this kind of raw data to figure out, do you want to use the default filters, or for your data set, does it make more sense to change the filters a little bit and come up with what's ideal for, for your data set. So again, this is just a report then uh, that ArrayStar automatically generates for you. So you don't have to crunch these numbers by hand, which would be, you know, is a huge, huge task to try to do this manually. So now what I'd like to do um, is go back to the PowerPoint and I'll show you some of the results then that we've, that we've generated um, using these data sets. Uh, and again, some of these are in our white papers. And some of them are just results that I generated uh, just recently. So if, if there's any questions at this point, um, I can I could certainly, let me look at the chat here. Maybe there's something here. Okay, I don't see any chats that have come in. Yeah, okay, no so questions I'll... yet, Matt, but uh, okay, yeah, great. feel free, everybody, to chat in your questions as uh, Matt goes through the webinar. Yeah. All righty, so I'll go back to our PowerPoint. So just a few more slides here. Okay, so here's, um, again, from the new white paper that we generated that is available on the DNSR website, uh, we, we have a comparison here of um, Seekman Engine to the BWA aligner that uses a couple different GATK SNP callers, the Unified Genotyper and the Haplotype base caller. And this is a software that is provided with, with MySeq instrumentation. So we thought that was a good you know, a good place to start. That's generally considered, you know, some of the best 
a, a software for doing SNP calls. So we thought we'd compare our software, you know, to to BWA GATK. And so this top table, table two, again is using the um, NA12878 exome, and we can see here. Um, let me grab a highlighter. You know, under true positives. Um, the BWA detects 14,831 or 820, and Seekman Engine, we're picking up, you know, a little more than 100 additional false positives, 14,938. So, you know, a little bit of an improvement there. So, and that's something that we've consistently seen is that Seekman Engine is able to find more positives. Um, the question is, you know, you know, why are we finding more positives? And, and if you look at the true negatives, and if we go way over here to percent bed coverage, this, this column over here, um, it turns out that our assembler, when, when it aligns the same data set, is actually aligning data to more regions. So we're getting a little bit better efficiency in the assembler, um, in, in coverage. And because of that, we're able to find more SNPs because we're getting that better coverage. Um, the false negative rate is also quite a bit lower than BWA. And we can look at the FDR, it's just a tad higher. Um, and then we have a sensitivity calculation, of course, at 99.7, that is uh, better than the BWA assemblies. We think we have an assembler that, you know, while both of them are very good, we think that we can um, um, be a little bit more accurate than that software. Certainly a lot easier to use um, running a BWA algorithm and trying to get the numbers out to do even validations is extremely difficult and time consuming. Uh, another important factor here is the elapsed time. And again, with our exomes and then running a validation report, you know, you're looking at, a, you know, a couple of hours per exome. And, you know, it's over six hours for the open source competitor. And so I think that we're, at this point in time, it looks like we can be quite a bit faster, a lot easier to use, and then have slightly better sensitivity. So we're really uh, encouraged by the results. Now, again, this is on... Um, the exome that we'll look at, this is called, is, is from the Garmon Institute. Um, it's freely accessible to um, customers so they can download this exact same data, um, run these exact same, um, go through our software and come up with these, with these numbers. So, um, and we'll look at, I have some data from additional exomes as well. Um, this table three is, is a much smaller data set. So this is um, a gene panel data set. It's a custom panel. And you can see that the number of positives is a lot smaller. It's in, you know, just over 700 positives, right? So it's much smaller than the exome. And again, with the data set, um, Seekman Engine is picking up more positives. Um, and the true negatives, which is, indicates the percent of the coverage, there's more true negatives. So again, as with the exome, um, there's more coverage across the targeted areas, and that helps us pick up more of these true positives. Um, the sensitivity then is, you know, 100% essentially. So we're, we're finding all the, the, the positives that are in these coverage regions. And then there's no false, false negatives in this case. And so we think that our software compared to what, you know, many consider to be the very best that we're able to, you know, beat them um, in terms of both ease of use and sensitivity and also speed of assembly. So again, these are all in the new white paper that is, uh, has just been posted to the DNA Star website. So there's a little bit more data here. So, um, so, so I, uh, again, earlier this month or late in January, I went to the short read archive and also the, uh, the Get RM website, which is hosted by the, it's a CDC and NIH where there's some more public data sets. And, and I found a, a couple of additional data sets. So it was the Garvan Institute exome that we used to generate the white paper data. Um, there's also an Arup Labs exome that we use for the software demo. And then the uh, ICON School of Medicine, Mount Sinai, uh, they also have an exome that's a bigger exome set. You can see the true positives here is 35,000 true positives. So it's a much larger uh, data set. And so I ran these just through the, the you know, through Seekman Engine into a Raystar and generated some numbers. And, you know, it was good to see that it's pretty consistent. Um, these exomes were captured in slightly different ways. And so you can see some differences in false discovery rates. And I think that relates somewhat to the way that the data was captured. Uh, you can see the sensitivity ranges anywhere from, you know, 99.6 all the way up to 99.92 with this ICON exome. So this is 
you know, really nice number. And I think it's pretty, the actual answer from genome on a bottle isn't quite 100%. So I think this is getting almost all the, 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 the variants out of 35,000. It's really an excellent result here. And you can see the exome coverage is at 97%. So, um, so very, very consistent results with exomes. Uh, we'll have additional data sets. There are more reference genomes in addition to NA12878 that Genome in a Bottle is curating. And so we anticipate to continue to, uh, you know, generate more um, data sets like this and fine tune our process. Um, there's also some, some new functionality uh, with ion torrent data. And so the ion torrent data, we, we've developed something that we call H-factor. And the H-factor um, deals with homopolymeric runs, which can be, um, can add, you know, a high degree of, of, of uh, false positives to ion torrent data. And, and so we've developed some of these tools to reduce the number of false positive calls without also um, severely impacting the sensitivity. So, and, and that's quite a challenge to, to, to do both of those things. And we can see here with the H-factor setting turned off, you know, we get about 20,614 positives, uh, but the false positives are high at 7,869, and that gives us a very high false discovery rate, right? So that's what we, we aim to improve. So we added some of these H-factor tools. When we set up our assembly and select the ion torrent, that will be turned on automatically. Um, there's a um, slight reduction in total positives, um, but the false positives go down dramatically to a very acceptable 4.62 false discovery rate. Um, and again, we have sensitivities that, um, you know, approach 96%. So we think that we have very, very good results now with the ion torrent data. We're really looking for more data sets with ion torrent. We realize that a lot of, um, a lot of the ion torrent customers are, in fact, working with panels. Um, and not, not quite as many with the exomes. Um, and with the panels, there's not that many validated data sets, so we're certainly um, keeping our eyes and ears open to find some more ion torrent data sets that we can validate with, the, with this uh, genome. And so that's kind of ongoing work, um, um, focusing some more on some ion torrent um, improvements. Uh, there's another paper that is a white paper that I think is coming out today that has this information in it. So. Um, if you go to our website, you can get more specific information on H-Factor. Some of these tools will also be used to further improve and enhance some of the SNP calling for other workflows like cancer workflows and somatic detection. So kind of looking ahead then um, to version 13 software. I don't know exactly what we'll have for version 13, but some of the things that we're, that we're working on are, you know, just further accuracy improvements. And, you know, it might be some focus on structural variations. You know, how do we find um, structural variants of varying sizes? Um, and, and there's ways that we can improve that and use these validated data sets in this validation process to really uh, make some gains there. And then I anticipate that we'll have some enhanced somatic variation detection. Um, some additional SNP calling probabilistic models for somatic variants. Um, we're looking at streamlining the workflows further. And so our validation workflow is pretty streamlined now, but we, we think that we can improve that more um, and make it even more streamlined. And then hopefully some additional white papers, making some different comparisons between additional assemblers and additional data sets. Uh, and then definitely uh, enhanced data analysis. So. Um, one of the projects that we're working on is linkage to more databases to pull into our SNP analysis, and, and that, that will be an ongoing project beyond version 13 as well. So with that, I'd be happy to stick around here a few minutes and, and, and answer any questions that anybody might have. Um, if, if you don't chat them in, you can certainly email them to Jackie, and, and I can get back to you later today. So again, thanks for your uh, uh, attention today, and, and have a good day. Thanks a lot, Matt. Um, so we have a couple questions, but um, they'll need a little more of a technical personal reply. Um, okay. So we'll follow up with you after the webinar. Um, again, as I'm wrapping up here, feel free to chat in your questions and we'll follow up with you later. Uh, you can email those to me at webinars at dnastar.com or again, tweet us at DNA Star Inc. Uh, also feel free to email me with any ideas for future webinars. Uh, thanks again for joining us today. We hope you found this webinar helpful. Uh, as Matt mentioned, we do have both a Illumina 
and an Ion Torrent specific uh, white paper that are posted right now on our website, so feel free to go check those out. Uh, additionally, we also have a large collection of videos uh, and webinar recordings as well. Uh, you can also download your fully functional free trial of LaserGene 12.2 uh, directly from our website. And we're currently scheduling some additional webinars, so I'd encourage you to check back uh, to our webinars page uh, soon, and you can uh, register for some of those future events. So thanks again for joining us, and have a great day.